to our dad on the Jim Crespin Podcast. Welcome to the Jim Crespin Podcast. My guest today is a self-proclaimed music nut. She is also the host on Sirius XM Radio and the host of the Women in Media Podcast. Welcome to the podcast, my friend, Sarah Burke. Nice to see you. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, looking forward to a little break here over the holidays. And although the last year plus has been kind of a break in itself, but it's been weird. I've still been coming to the office like every day. Uh, What's it been like for you? I have been working from this space that you see um, since I moved here in September 2020, but I was at my other, you know, apartment before that. So, yeah, I've been working from home since uh, March. What was it? 20th or something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And are you an introvert or an extrovert? I mean, if you had to guess, you could probably tell I'm an extrovert, but. Yeah. But but sometimes, sometimes people are trained like they've developed extrovert tendencies over time you know especially in the media world i think the pandemic trained me to have some introvert tendencies i will say and it was good it was good for me so tell me about that what do you mean uh i i get energy from the people around me right and um you know a lot of my colleagues as well as like teachers growing up i've heard this my entire life you set the tone when you walk when you walk into a room Mm -hmm. Uh, and people tend to like gravitate to your energy so if you're in a bad mood everyone feels it if you're in a good mood everyone feels it I get that a lot I guess that's like a strong personality thing I don't know Um, but yeah like I love being out like even if I'm tired let's say at the end of a workday at 5 p.m the idea of going to see a band I love perform whips me right out of that like it's fine so you found that you had to become more self-sufficient in finding sources for your energy over the pandemic while you were forced to be an introvert for the first time in a long time or maybe ever in your life yeah and a little more like self-care because i'm not someone good at saying no to things i like saying yes and being like a go-to person for stuff so it was a really interesting exercise i would say in um finding your own personal boundaries and it's it's something that like you're almost groomed in this industry to say yes to everything, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's been a really interesting exercise in asking myself, like, do do you need to say yes to everything at this point in your career? Like, you can be a little choosier now. I love being open and, like, taking risks and trying new things, but you don't have to do everything. Yeah, it's funny. When you start a career in media, in the music industry, or even as an artist, Uh, For the first few years, you're more likely to die of starvation. And then at some point, you hit this critical mass where you're more likely to die of indigestion, right? And you have to start saying no to things, (laughs) or you are just going to be overwhelmed, you're going to run out of bandwidth, and you're going to burn out. So it's, it's good that you had a chance to sit back and wrestle with that a while and become self aware of it. And then, uh, you know, learn to, to set up better boundaries. So Hey, silver linings, man. Yeah, I would say I'm still at the very beginning of that journey, to be honest. Um, I I became more self-aware, and now, just now, I'm starting to implement. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, to be fair to yourself and to anybody in this business, you're you're conditioned to, like you said earlier, become a go-to person, a reliable individual who people can count on as support or... uh, competent in the space that you're being asked to serve in right and so you enjoy filling that void and you get conditioned and a little addicted to that and then at some point you have to go okay if I'm trying to fill voids for everybody else I'm gonna have a huge hole left in my life Mm -hmm. yeah well good on you Uh, I hope that journey continues to be successful for you and I wanted to talk a little bit about your podcast uh, women in media so how long have you been in media yourself? Uh, I guess my start would be 2007 as an intern. Okay, so you've been in this business now for, let's say, a decade and a half, 14 years. <laughs> yeah. um, when you started, the industry was even more male-dominated than it is now. Mm-hmm. But you felt like you needed to wade into this world. What gave you that that confidence, that zeal, that enthusiasm to to just go for it 
regardless of how the industry looked from a demographic perspective at the time. It, it, so in, in launching the podcast you're talking about? No, no. I think this plays into what you talk about on the podcast, mm-hmm. but more just getting involved in media when okay. it's like a male dominated industry and you see it and you go, no, 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 I, I can get in there and I can make my mark. What gave you that confidence? I think it was just the love of the music. And for me, my early loves in music were, um, they happened to be rock, right? They happened to be rock cleaning. And out of all so the who genres. your favorite bands in 2007? <laughs> well, I mean, th- there's one band that's always at the top and people are going to make fun of it, but it's Weezer. I, I'm a huge Weezer fan and I, I'm sorry to those people because Nothing I wrong will. With Weezer. Nothing wrong at all. Oh my gosh. Like I, I got the opportunity to see them perform Pinkerton front to back and not like I could have died happy that day. Like I'm, I love, I love Weezer anyway. Um, yeah. So, you know, I listen, radio was a big thing for me, um, in the car on the way to school with my, you know, my mom and she was like, I was in a carpool. So we had to come to some sort of conclusion as to who got to listen to what that was okay in the car for everyone. Cause there were some, my sister was younger. One of the other kids in the carpool was younger. And then there was someone older. So we did eventually, we moved around from like, like a CHR uh, top 40 station to a rock station. But once I was in high school, I was, I, I could pick what I wanted and it was just me listening to, you know, my Walkman or to my boom box with the radio on it. Right. And by that point I had determined I loved this certain rock station. Uh, luckily enough, I did end up getting to work there for a little bit, which was very cool. Uh, but yeah, like I, I think that sort of what got me into wanting to do it was my love for radio and my love for those bands on that radio station. It's called the so- edge in Toronto. The Edge in Toronto. So you followed your heart into it. You didn't focus too much on the analytics or the perceived limitations. I don't um, think it ever crossed my mind, to be honest. That's amazing. That should happen more often. Um, Okay, so back to Weezer, because I love that band. I've actually toured that band before. Nice. Um, Done some shows (laughs) in secondary markets. Uh, At the time, 2007, like Hash Pipe, was that the big song? Uh, Was it that one? Was it Beverly Hills? They're they're in like Beverly Hills by yeah. then I think yeah R- right around that okay yeah, yeah they're they're make great believe band. and then the red album the red album that's what it was so that's pork and beans and do you still listen to albums the old school way front to back or do you know focus you more on the singles see now my I have a lot of vi- vinyl oh yeah I yeah. see the vinyl okay <laughs> I like to listen to it that way like you know I I have. <laughs> I have my Sirius XM, I have my Spotify, I have uh, Apple Music, I have Amazon, I have it all. Mm -hmm. But my favorite way to listen is back there. Yeah, my daughters are eight and 10 years old. And to them, it's sort of like something that I've had to nurture and, and even introduce to them is this idea that an artist isn't just a single. You know, they're not just this one song like they they put out these albums and these albums are a body of work and they will have a flow to them if you listen to them from yeah. front to back, which, of course, you know, you would have grown up in the era of CDs, but you know how important it was to have a CD with 10 or 12 songs on it by artist XYZ that just had a flow, certain tempos, certain subject matters, you know, mm. introduced at different aspects of the album and that's a that's a a composition of work in context that we just don't get to be exposed to anymore and i wonder what will be lost along with that process do you have those same concerns i think i did like in 2007 let's say but if you know if music fans have shown us anything over the last like 10 15 years it's that vinyl's going nowhere and and that idea of like physically holding something i think you know it is one of the few types of music consumption that's increasing every year in sales yeah cds is a totally different story but i mean there's there's reasons it doesn't sound as good we'll put it that way just to keep it short but like compression yeah, yeah like the more i interview artists now where i'm trying to get at like a specific um concept or mood that they would have been in when they were writing a piece of work the more and more they're telling like artists these days are telling me that like 
they're they're looking for everyone to have their own mood associated with their record, right? They they don't want to like share their own story. It's like, oh, I like to leave that up to like the person listening. I'm hearing more and more of that these days. And that's what the vinyl collection is about for me because when I'm feeling a little sad, I have a record that I want to pick up that I'm like, this goes with that mood. Or if I'm like, Friday night, let's go, you know, I want to put on Queens of the Stone Age and Rage Against the Machine. Or, you know, so it's it's about that for me. Yeah, me maybe you feel the same way. I always felt like music was the first drug I was introduced to. And I have, I've been addicted ever since. Like the idea that you can put on an album or even a single and just totally change your mood, you know, and, and totally embrace a new state of emotional well-being. Or, you know, if you're feeling like you want to wallow in the sadness for a yeah, while, yeah. you can do that as it. well. Hey, sometimes yeah, you totally. need a glass of red and your dashboard confessional record. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. And a bathtub of warm water. Sometimes that works too. <laughs> sometimes right? that works Put it all too. together. Put it all together. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I really admire and respect about you is that when you did garner more attention in the industry and more of a profile, one of the first things you did was launch your Women in Media podcast to focus on the um, the disparity between the sexes in our industry and in media in general. But I think we could carry that forward to the music industry and to artists within the industry. Have you found that launching that podcast has brought more awareness to that disparity? Um, what rewarding stories do you have from that journey so far? Hmm. Um, I, I think the most rewarding part so far has been um, a safe space. Um, a lot of people are trusting me with their stories, you know, and it's shocking what some people have shared with me that I didn't expect people to share with me. So I think the most rewarding part is a safe space to sort of unpackage what some of the intricacies of this industry are with someone like-minded. Um, but I have to say like this podcast is one of like many things like that out there right now. So it really feels like community building at the, you know, when I, when I think about what is it accomplished for me this year, it's community building. And, you know, I've, I've said this in many episodes too, like the biggest shock is that you have women who are so powerful to women that are just getting started all saying the same thing to me at some point in every episode. And that is something about imposter syndrome and not thinking they're good enough. And that's where, you know, we have to think about the systems that create these feelings and why. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm so like curious about like, how we can go back in time to, you know, we can't go back in time, but how, how by reviewing, you know, the past, we can set up for a better future. Okay. Yeah. And I can tell you that from the perspective of a man, uh, imposter syndrome is not necessarily something that is just a gender specific sure. issue. Yeah. I think that, I think, I think it's, you know, it may be a bit more prevalent, um, I don't know what the statistics are, but anecdotally speaking, I think that a lot of men encounter that. Maybe they're just a little better at hiding it. Um, but if you mm. haven't felt it, it's almost like a testament to the fact that you haven't wrestled with some self-awareness, which I actually think is a really good exercise for both men and women for you sure, know, to yeah. go, hey, listen, what do I actually know after all these years and where am I lacking? And is there anything I can do to fill some of those voids? Uh, to make myself feel like I'm navigating from a place of more knowledge, certainty, and security, right? So that's interesting I, I do that think that's been a reoccurring theme. Yeah, and it, it does usually come up in a way where there's uh, there's been some sort of incident that has brought them to feel that way. And more times than not, it, it does involve, uh, you know, not feeling good enough in comparison to male colleagues. It's not that the male colleagues are creating the problems, though. It's the system. Right. Like a lot of um, my guests just talk about, um, you know, the way that structurally their companies that they've worked for have been set up. And unfortunately, in the structure is where some of these females fall into these places sometimes. So, so are you talking about like the hierarchies within companies and titles and that sort of yeah. thing? Yeah. My very first guest, uh, Josie Dye, who worked at, you know, The Edge, she's like a fixture of The Edge uh, for many years. You know, she, she was talking about how there was even an era at The Edge where 
she felt set up to like work against other women there at that time. Uh, and she said, and I have to say this, it's not the boss's fault. I didn't feel as though the person I reported to was responsible for this. It was layers and layers deep, right? So that's, I try to make a point of saying that that podcast is not a place to bash men. That's not what it's about. It's about recognizing the things that play into the way it is. And having some hard conversations so yeah. that we actually might get to some solutions. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I think that's, that's one of the nuances that seems to be lost in modern day discourse is this inability to say, this is how I see the world. Please educate me as to how you might see it so that we can come to an understanding, mm -hmm. right? Rather than trying to impress your version of reality onto someone else. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I commend you for that. It's well, tough. Thank you. Well, and, and, you know, there's different generations out there too. And my dad, I'm going to use as an example, because he's not from the podcasting generation at all. Um, but, you know, he had a discussion with me the other day about putting she or her in your signature, right? And how it displays your, you know, your uh, commitment to inclusivity to somebody else. And, you know, I don't think conversations like that happen with all generations naturally. So if, you know, sh sure, a lot of the people listening might be industry people, but I know that people who have never considered what it's like to be in the media that just know who I am from, let's say, high school might check it out too. So I just hope that these conversations can maybe open some eyes too. So what did your dad do for a profession? My dad's a window guy. He does okay. high rise, high rise Blue buildings. collar guy. Yeah. Like, and it's a family window business that's been around for a long time. Yeah. So what was the response from your folks when you said, I want to take, I want to forge this path in this industry? <laughs> um, were they supportive right away or did they have some doubts? Like how was it received initially? My parents are like, they are gems. There's no other way to put that. I have never felt discouraged about anything um, that I wanted to do. Um, I mean, other than maybe something that requires you to be home at a certain time, which you can understand. Right. <laughs> Like, you know, having a not, I want to call it a deadline, but that's not the word I'm searching for. Uh, when you have to be home at a certain time, you're like for dinner or what do you mean? Or like, yeah, when you're, you're going out with having your friends, structure? when you're going out with your friends and your parents say no. Oh, okay. You mean like a curfew? Curfew. Yeah. It's on the tip okay. of my tongue. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So other than a curfew or things like that, I've, I've never felt discouraged from doing anything with my parents, but my, I definitely took the scenic route to get here. Um, I wasn't too far set back time-wise in that scenic route, but like I thought I wanted to be a journalist writing and I right. went to Carleton university in their journalism program I was getting great marks, but I decided two months in that I was really bored and I wanted to leave. So that's what, brought me home to intern at the radio station because that seemed more exciting. And my parents were still very supportive, even with me changing my mind after things like that. And, and, you know, back then you lean on your parents for a lot during like those days. And like, I was lucky, like my parents helped me pay um, for university. I would work all summer and then give them the money and everything else. They'd be like, you worked all summer. Thank you very much. And here we are helping you out with this. So yeah, we're, we're going to offset a little of this for you. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. So that was part of the deal you had with your parents, that they would pay for your education, but you had to. I always contribute. still had worked. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. I worked and while I was in university. what were some of those summer jobs? What were some of those summer jobs? <laughs> Dairy Queen. <laughs> Love it. My, no, I worked at um, American Eagle. Can you make a e mean blizzard? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, American Eagle and Dairy Queen were yeah. my two most prominent part-time jobs like before moving out of the house um and uh i did a lot of like i worked with an autistic um girl at day camp so i was her like one-on-one -on -one. um i did camp counselor stuff like for years and years and years throughout high school until like grade 11 and that's when dairy queen and american eagle came in <laughs> yeah. love it <laughs> so you were talking about the pronouns in the bio earlier yeah and um and this has come up a little bit. I don't know if it's come up on podcasts, but it's come up in conversations. And I want to get your thoughts on this because I struggle with it a bit in that I wonder how much of it 
I wonder what the balance is between showing you're an ally and that you're of an inclusive spirit and mindset mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. versus appropriation of uh, a certain segment of the population who, you know, for one reason or another have had issues defining that at least forward facing. They've always mm-hmm. known what they were internally, but externally they've struggled with presenting themselves in a, in a light that, you know, might be how they identify. Right. Yeah. So for me, I just see it as one of these things where I haven't quite come to an understanding on it. So I'd love to talk to about that with you and get your perspective on it, because I think, I think these things can be more complicated or maybe I'm just overthinking it, but yeah, always willing to hear that side of it. I I have so much to learn still, even uh, in my position, but um, you know, it was really important in my first like eight episodes that I tackled uh, that, you know, it, at least in a way where I could have a conversation in a safe space with someone who wants to help others learn about it, who are uncomfortable about it. Right. Right. So um, I had a guest on Aaron Carroll. Aaron is a publicist and Aaron has been a friend for years. And um, Aaron was the perfect human to have that conversation with because Aaron comes from a warm place where Aaron wants what's best for everyone. And um, resources were provided for me to read up on before and after our conversation. Um, I think that's part of it too. Like it can, all of this kind of stuff can look performative if it's just to, for a social media post to say, I have someone from the LGBTQ2 plus community on my podcast. Okay. That's that I, I believe that that's performative as well as many others. Um, yeah. So much of it is about dialing into your intent. Yeah. Right? So, and, and so, yeah, please continue. I even consulted Aaron uh, in my planning stages of this podcast, as a matter of fact. There was a time where the podcast was going to be called Women in Media with an X. Like W-O-M-X-N in media. Okay. And my intent at that point was being inclusive. But Aaron said, you, you know, after providing some resources and talking it through with me and like giving me a lot of time and consideration to like think these things through with someone who I know is an active member of an LGBTQ mm-hmm. plus community that has constant discussion. Uh, Aaron, Aaron was saying, you know, I don't think that the X makes your podcast any more or less inclusive. Um, and as long as when you're going to have a guest on that is, you know, female identifying um, or, you know, whatever, that that you just call it out as it is. Like, like stop making it so complicated is essentially yeah. where, it, where it went. Um, the X was almost what you're getting at as like going overboard. It wouldn't have been performative because there was still good intention behind it, I think. Yeah. But, but people might not have known that from the outside looking in. Right yeah. 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 So, and you know, like, I think my commitment to that type of conversation is that I need to continue having those types of conversations. You know, there's, um, a guest I really want to have on, I won't mention the name yet because I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to come to fruition anytime soon, but there's a guest that has gone through, um, a transition, um, in their media role. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm so interested and curious to hear about the challenges that went along with that, but when that person's comfortable, you know, mm-hmm. so it's about, they're not just being one token guest. See what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. 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 Tokenism is a, it's a, it's a fine line, you know, mm-hmm. and again, it dials back to intent, but um, I have often had that discussion with individuals in our in- industry, mostly because I want to make sure that we are making decisions that aren't going to be plagued with unintended consequences down the road and that we do end up on the right side of history. And and so having that, that discussion about the difference between inclusion and tokenism, right? And mm-hmm. knowing where that line is so that we're not, you know, including someone to make sponsors, broadcasters, et cetera, feel comfortable that we've checked a box, mm-hmm. right? But actually going out of our way to go, no, 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 we want to we want to show the industry and we want to show the world that this is a safe place for people of all identities and that they are welcome here, right? You and I normally, um, I guess, interact 
around the country music scene, right? Right. And, you know, we we just saw an amazing broadcast. Um, I, I don't think that that was tokenism. I thought that that was very inclusive, not just a performance, but hosting. Priyanka was amazing, you know, and I think it opened up a side to the Canadian Country Music Awards we have not seen before. Well, I will say this, Priyanka kicked ass uh, in terms of the performance and mm -hmm. uh, the hosting job was impeccable. Um, I was very happy with the way all of that went down. I mean, I still think that we have to be really cognizant of ensuring that we are not putting people in positions specifically because of skin color or gender oh, identity. Yeah. yeah. You know, we have to be we have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not positive what side of the line that that fell on. But I will say this. I will say that the job done was impeccable. That mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what pronoun Priyanka uses. Is it she? He, she? she? Okay, she. Okay, mm -hmm. so she did a great job. Like mm -hmm. she did a great job hosting, co-hosting, uh, the performance and the treatment around it. And the dancers yeah. just blew my mind. So, you're you're getting at something really interesting that comes up in a lot of the work I do with the indigenous community too, um, with you know not putting someone in a certain position just because of A, B, or C, right? right? Yes. And with um, like the indigenous community, for for example, you know, um, a guest I recently had on my podcast who's also a musician, um, Shoshona Kish. She's part of Digging Roots. Um, you know, she brought up a really interesting point that I had never even considered before, which was, you know, traditionally we're used to, our ears are used to a certain definition of what we hear on the radio in format A, B, or C, right? But if we allow for the expansion of what those traditional sounds are, whether it be Indigenous music or whether it be like, you know, Priyanka, for example, I think she's she's got some country hits, you know, I've seen it in my inbox. But she's got some pop hits too, right? I think it's about expanding the horizons of what we normally hear in that playlist that will make people watching a big show understand that maybe there is merit for those sounds to be in other places too. And I think a lot of that was happening, to be fair, yeah. like even within the community of country music. If you listen to country music from the 90s and go back to the 70s, it has yeah. certainly <laughs> evolved, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's no denying that it's become much more pop influenced yeah. and there's rock influences and you know all kinds of of different musical genres now in a melting pot within the format but yeah. i don't disagree that that can be stretched even more and then you know figuring out what the combination is to make sure that the music still remains something that is consumed at a rapid rate so that we have platforms to break new artists of all backgrounds on, right? It's about risk taking too, right? And I mean, what a time to be alive where in in 2021, an indigenous person who, you know, basically lives on the idea of uh, this land has been taken from me, right? Is thinking, what do you mean my traditional sounds don't have a place on the radio on in my land? You know, that that's sort of what I'm getting at. Right. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. You know, I think um I think that uh there's a place for it. I think that we still have to be somewhat aware of what consumers commercial which by and yeah. large in the country music space are, you know, white cisgendered people, right? Yeah. What they are responding to. Not to say that you can't develop an affinity or a love for uh, other, other cult. You know, the first person who did it really successfully in the 1990s was Susan Ann Glucart. Yeah. Um, she had a song called OCM, which I believe became a top 10 hit on Canadian country music at the time. I'd have to look up the stat, but I know I was working in radio at the time Yeah. and we were playing the shit out of that song and we all rocked out to it. And it was like, we didn't even draw the connection between the the cultural significance of the song it was just like it had a kick-ass melody a kick-ass beat and i love the fact that it united 
people who didn't necessarily share the same background that Susan has mm -hmm. to enjoy art. And I think that that's one of the most beautiful things about art is that it does erase some of our differences and dissolve some of our borders because it brings us under this umbrella of, you know, this is great. And it doesn't really matter if your ancestors came from Africa or Ireland. It's great, mm -hmm. you know, or they're indigenous, whatever. Like, that's one of the things that I love about art and one of the reasons why I continue to find true meaning in what I do because I look at the world and I look at divisiveness and I look at politics and I look at how politicians, you know, many politicians love to play into divisiveness because it gives them an anchor of mm -hmm. uh, a demographic to perform to. And, uh, and yet art, it's just, if it's great art, it's great art, it's undeniable and it doesn't matter where it came from or where it originated and all people can enjoy it. And that's a beautiful thing. And thinking about the ways in which we consume art, um, if you'll allow me, you know, I would love to share a moment that happened with Dallas Smith on um, a broadcast that I worked on with him. Please do. Um, so we put together um, a program for uh, the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in Canada uh, on our Indige Indigiverse channel on Sirius XM. And the whole point of it was to make sure we were including white people and indigenous people so that we could candidly have you know conversations in a safe space but open eyes on both sides to how we can come together right and um so i asked dallas if he would be a part of it um and i wanted to pair him up with alan gray eyes who's a fixture in the indigenous music community in in canada based in manitoba and um he runs a festival um, and does a lot of artist advocacy do you know alan by the way Cause you're kind of on the west i've like, heard the name yeah you have heard the name okay yeah um so alan as the indigenous person dallas as uh you know coming from the the white side and yeah. um one of the most beautiful parts that came out of that conversation and i had almost i had stopped recording and i started again because of where they were going um you know alan alan was answering a question dallas has, had asked him about how he could uh think about you know, being more inclusive to Indigenous communities with what he does. And Alan said, you know, when you come through here, a lot of the times it's a big concert and a lot of Indigenous people who have had trouble in the school system, there, there's almost something that they would associate with like the idea of someone being on stage. It's like the teacher in the class, right? And, and the levels of someone being up and someone being down. Um, so what an interesting thing. I had never thought about a concert being like that before. And then he said, you know, with how well your songs would sound around a campfire, let's just say, and knowing that there's always great writing behind what you do. He's like, if there was a chance to somehow put something together with you in the future, where maybe you do do the big concert, but then there's this, like, are our people they do well when they're in um they're integrated into the art where it's you can participate in they're the participating art. in it yeah i just found that so interesting because you know like there's just so many the ways that we think about taking in music it's, mm -hmm. it's been the same way for a, a really long time and and if you go to the roots of music in indigenous communities like that's a way to bring two artists together like maybe it's an indigenous artist in dallas both doing that all together right like just such an interesting idea yeah and i mean i don't think it's um i don't think it's necessarily proprietary purely to indigenous communities if you go back far enough oh yeah you know, like, if you go back far enough every place on the planet people were originally probably performing around a campfire so there's probably within all of our dna this desire to reconnect with that organic method of distributing our art, right? Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's about finding the commonalities, um, mm -hmm. or at least that's what I think it is. It's like, this, this is something that might be proprietary, but if I can connect deep enough in my roots, maybe there's a place where they both meet up together, Yeah. right? And, and I think there's something to be said for that. And, it's it's always interesting, a little awkward to talk to in this day and age where everybody wants to make sure that they're <clears throat> saying the right thing. Yeah, saying the right thing and yeah. politically correct. And and I understand all that. And I'm I'm not I'm not denigrating that, but I also think 
that you have to reserve the right to sometimes say something that could be perceived as insensitive or stupid if you're trying to learn about it. You know, yeah. think about think about going back to school, elementary school, and learning anything, and how many times you you put up your hand to ask a question, and maybe the teacher's like, "We've already covered that," or "Yeah, <clears throat> you should know this by now." You know, like if we're learning once in a while, we're going to say things that are a little out of turn, and and the key, I believe, to getting to a place where we can all have a better understanding of each other is allowing that space for someone to say something and go, oh, I see where you're coming from, but this is how it is, right? And um, anyway, That's what I'm, I'm talking from. a lot of generalizations, but but I think you understand what I'm where I'm coming from. And please know that like those uh, those things that you're saying, I've gone through all of those thoughts in hosting a podcast where I want diverse guests, you know, They're, I'm going to say something stupid sometimes. It's going to happen. Um, I think it's up to, I think it's up to people who want to like expand, you know, a narrow mind. I think it's up to people to take risks and so be it. If I sound silly one time, that's a lot of what the guests are bringing to my podcast uh, mm -hmm. is again, a safe space for me to ask the questions. Right. And it's not necessarily a narrow mind in, in like a a derogatory sense. No. It's lack of experience in that realm. You know, I I, I remember um, when I was growing up, I went to elementary school in a place called Denelda, Alberta. And my parents ranched about 14 miles outside of town. And there was a man in his 80s. In that I thought town you fell down from the mountains, no? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was grown up from the prairies. Yeah. Uh, but there was this man in his 80s who was a fixture around town and probably around the age of 85, 87 years old, he decided he was going to start identifying as a woman and dressing mm -hmm. that way. And to elementary school kids, it was just kind of strange, right? But he was a friend to all of us. He would walk by and visit the school and, ch and, and, and just a sweetheart of a guy. And through that process of asking very innocent childlike questions, but getting an understanding of, you know, how he just felt more comfortable in that place, it really helped, I think, condition at least that class of kids against this idea that if there's separation in how people identify, that there's something wrong with them, mm -hmm. right? Like the parents were generally much more judgmental because they'd had their real world conditioning and their own experiences. And the kids were more sort of like, Hey, wh why are you doing that? You know, like what's yeah. the deal, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, the questions yeah. come from a more innocent place. Totally from a more innocent place. But as adults, sometimes that's where they come from too. And we can't sure. forget that as we're having these discussions. And mm -hmm. I was reading some articles recently about, um, women in media, women in music. And obviously I knew that this would be a great topic given your podcast. Okay. Um, uh, Andrea Bossi in Forbes uh, talked about gender disparity in the music industry. And she identified three predominant sources for why there feels like there's more barriers for women in our industry. And one is ageism, especially on the oh, artist yeah. side. Um, the other is male dominated resources, especially on the artist side. So, you know, chances are if you're a female artist, you're probably going to have a male producer, right? Because 98% of them are male. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably going to have, or there's a better chance today that you might have a female agent or manager, but back in the day, it was a male dominated industry. And then the uh, third thing was uh, gender based harassment, just by virtue of people capitalizing on on bigotry or whatever it is, right? Yeah. So I thought I'd get your take on those three potential obstacles for women in music and maybe even speak to your own experiences on that, mm -hmm. on those fronts. Okay, so ageism is the first one. A um, 100% a problem, 100% there. I mean, <laughs> almost every woman I know in the industry or female identifying, um, would say that they like you know there's time is working against them although <clears throat> inside i feel like most women in media right now are very comfortable with aging so it's a perception it's what not about changed 
I think we're past all the like, you know, Venus razor commercials and, and, you know, I, I think we're past all that, all those campaigns, like social media has ripped everything apart and exposed everything. Like, so we are past this idea that the value of a woman is tied to her um, mm -hmm. beauty per se, yeah. or her youth or her uh, contribution potentially to being a, a, productive member of society in childbearing terms you know like that yeah. idea that antiquated notion you think we're getting past that i think we're getting past that and i think you know like so what if if a woman decides she wants to get um i'm gonna you know say like some work done whether face or body or whatever um i think they're wearing it prouder now it's it's not because they're trying to be young it's because they wanted to and it makes them feel powerful and good that right. that's what i think that's sort of the way that I see it. Um, and, and most, uh, Tracy, who, you know, the former president of the CCMA is a perfect Tracy example. Martin. Shout out to Tracy. Tracy Martin. Oh my gosh. Like, you know, she said some incredible things about aging in the episode of my podcast, um, with her. I think she was the second episode and you know how the second she got comfortable with like inside everything else fell into place. And I think that's what is happening with a lot more women these days. So yeah, like does, does the, especially on TV, right? Like, you know, you got to look a certain way to have high ratings, right? Is that still there? Yes, it's still there. But um, I think that people know it's unacceptable now. But, but also, don't you think that that is a, a generalization that and it might be true i'm not saying it's not true but it might be also a miscalculated generalization by a few people who have made an assumption that the audience is superficial and that real journalism whether it's delivered by somebody who's 26 years old and supermodel ready or somebody who's 48 years old and has extreme credibility that People are more likely to defer, especially in the realm of news, to someone who has credibility. Oh, yeah, for sure. For news, I think for sure, credibility matters way more. Uh, and the people who choose to look a, a certain way, I think at the end of the day, again, are choosing to do that for them, not their audience. Right, right. Well, yeah, and I think that that's something that, that has certainly evolved over the last few mm -hmm. years, that people are finding more comfort in in this idea of aging and you know, I, listen, I know a lot of dudes, too, who are, like, really sensitive about their ages. And I've I've encountered a few in our industry where I said, oh, you know, how old are you? And, like, they don't even want to tell you. And that's happened to me twice with men. Yeah. I've, never, I've never asked a woman because there is sort of, like, that line. But it's happened to me twice with men in the industry where I'm like, who gives a shit? You know? A whole other layer of this now, too, is... Um young people in media have tools and tricks that like I don't have as a woman turning 35 years old. I know that there's technology that like, I'm, I'm not a good TikToker. Sorry, I'm not, you mm -hmm. know? So there's all sorts of different things about your age right now that like, maybe it used to be about looking young, but now it's like, what do you bring to the table? Yes. Oh, I like that. That's going to be a <laughs> clip right there. That's a clip. Okay. Sorry. So <laughs> male dominated resources so this is something you would have some experience with male dominated resources uh is okay so is there more resource for men is what you're no saying. no sorry uh it's a potential barrier or an obstacle for women because most of the resources to actually ascend mm -hmm. uh are male dominated resources so mm -hmm. you know especially if you're an artist your agent, your producer, your manager, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. 25 years ago, good chance they're all men. You know, I, I think back to the beginning of my career and because I was working in rock um, at the time, like a lot of the contacts I have today that I would say are, you know, have even become like good friends of mine in the industry. It all started because I was very gung-ho on hanging with the boys back, back in the day. And I was comfortable to do it and I never felt like, you know, like it was, no, you know how so many women will have that, like, oh, did you get that job because, right? And right. it's like, no, I got the job because I could provide ratings results, <laughs> like, and because I'm 
good at this, this, and this. So I think what I'm getting at is uh, no doubt that being comfortable to hang with the boys earlier in my career has laid the foundation for some of the relationships that I have now that I hold near and dear to my heart as both friends and colleagues. But um, resource-wise, like financially, if you look at what is, you know, it's it's changing. But leading up to this point, if you if you look at what a, a woman is being paid to do in the exact same role and a guy's doing it like most of the time you're going to find a huge disparity and so financial in media yeah uh and you know has that been documented or studied i i'm not more anecdotal i'm i'm speaking from i mean the experience that i have and the people who have shared their personal stories with me which i would never speak about publicly but from from my experience that's the case. And the second that you start, um, you know, advocating for yourself, you kind of feel like you're uh, poking the bear or, you know, being difficult. So those are the things that are associated with that piece to me. And I really wish it wasn't like that. You know, if you can prove yourself and like anyone, male or female, early, early in their career should have to prove themselves. Agreed. Right? But after five years, if you have a solid, solid track record and success associated with it, then the disparity should be corrected. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and we need to dispel with this myth that a woman is being difficult because she wants to be paid what she's worth, you know, and, and that's something that we all need to be paying attention to. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, I don't think it exists everywhere. I mm-hmm. think that, you know, there's still some gatekeepers who carry that narrative around in their heart. But I think there's a lot of people who, just like you explained earlier, they're like, listen, if they drive ratings, get the job done, I'm going to pay them what I need to keep them around or they're going to go to my competitor. You know, I think there's a lot of people thinking about this rationally too. Um, but you, of course, do hear about many cases where, Mm-hmm. people feel like they've gotten the raw end of the deal and and understandably so if they're doing the same job they should absolutely be making the same money another display of this conferences festivals mm-hmm. who's sitting on the panel um i forget the name of the festival i feel like it's an alberta festival but there was something announced this week that you know there's several artists speaking out against right now that like in this time there's no excuse for having this little female representation on your you know on your festival lineup and things like that mm. i could probably find it if i looked i'll send you a note after if you want yeah to send me a note after i'm not familiar uh, with that but i'd be interested to know where yeah. the other prize come from it was in my feed well that I, right. well, I was looking at something earlier today i should have noted down the name of the festival but it wasn't one that i was uh familiar with but yeah like you know up until like maybe five years ago there was the women's breakfast at canadian music week and it's like can't we just have breakfast with everyone and Put us on the panel. This is why we get along. Because I agree. And put everyone, like, make sure that there's some females on your Mm -hmm. other panels. They don't have to be in their own panel. (laughs) You know, and I didn't. The thing is, some of those things are needed to drive change. So I'm all about that. And if I can raise my hand and be part of a, a, a group that shows females, like, hey, sometimes it's opening a door for someone who's not comfortable uh, networking in the other group maybe it's not about you maybe it's about someone else and what you can give back right especially at this point in my career i like mentoring if i can you know if i have time i like to so that's where you know uh we don't in 2021 2022 2023 like moving forward we do not need women's specific panels and women's specific events right this podcast is you know, the women in media podcast, it's like, well, do we need your women in media podcast? Well, we're discussing the reasons why there, (laughs) you know, but yeah, I don't don't disagree that sometimes you need, you need trailblazers to instigate change. Absolutely. And draw attention. Yeah. But you're right. At a certain point, it starts to feel patronizing, right? It starts to feel a little condescending, I think. And, And again, I'm just empathizing and friends of mine who, um, who are female who work in the industry who have said, echoed exactly what you've just said, like, 
I am pulling my weight in all echelons of this business, mm -hmm. not just as a woman, but as mm -hmm. an industry individual. And I want to be treated as such. And I see a lot of validity in that. And listen, I'm a dad of two daughters. Like I, I want to see a world where there is more equality and that nobody's being held back because of their, their gender or their gender identity. But also I want to make sure that, that they're armed with this idea of knowing that they've got to compete against everyone. And not just, that, not just guys, but everyone. Right. Right. And not yeah. just women, everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that they've got to, they've got to, they've got to be so obsessed and so in love with whatever it is they choose to do as a profession that they will just rise to the top by virtue of the fact that they will be so enthralled to be involved with it. Right. Passion. And yeah, passion. Absolutely. And, and drive and the ability to navigate failure and rejection. And so um, that's going to be part of it. No matter what's between your legs, you're going to fail and you're going to get rejected. Right. And knowing that and, and not necessarily always tying it back to your immutable characteristics, but also going, being self-aware enough to go, okay, that person is a sexist asshole, but this other guy or gal gave me some really good feedback that I can integrate into my competency package to be better, a better candidate for that job next time. You know, yeah. Of all the challenges in this in this media space, I would say the number one for me is in how I'm addressed sometimes. And it's almost like I have felt like an administrative assistant sometimes. I have felt like, like uh, one time that I was very passionate about a decision it was a, you know, a, a work decision that we had to make as a team. When I got into it, because I was passionate about it, I was asked if I was uh, overwhelmed and needed to take the afternoon off. Would you ever ask that to a male colleague? I don't think so. So those are the things that eat away at, at me. Right. I know and what I'm Did you I'm pull worried. that person out in that moment? I did not. And it was a very different time. Yeah, in my and career. fair enough. I'm not, I'm not yeah. casting aspersions I wish on I did. for not going there, but, but that might also help them with their awareness because mm -hmm. again, dialing back to where we started, yeah. intent matters. Sometimes people, you know, I've had these conversations a lot too. It's like, sometimes people are really offensive who actually don't mean to be, they're mm -hmm. just conditioned to yeah. think a certain way. And, and if you can arrest them in that moment, stop them in that moment. Yeah. I am a big love fan of passion. That. Yeah, then then they'll go, oh my God, like I didn't realize I was coming off as such a condescending asshole. I am sorry. And and I, I, I was just yeah. concerned about you as a person, you know? Yeah, and, and at that moment, I did, you know, the best I could mutter up with how mad I was inside at that moment. Yeah, fair enough. The best I could mutter up was, no, I'm good. I'll be here all afternoon, <laughs> you know, with a smile. So that was that moment. But, you know, that was also a different time in my career. And I think I've grown into a different person who would say something if it happened today right now um, mm -hmm. that way. But, yeah, the, the administrative assistant type of feel, you know, it's like, please don't treat me like that. Look at the work I'm doing. Yeah. I need an administrative assistant, actually. But Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No, and, and, and I think, again, like as the world evolves, as things change, uh, you know, people will be less likely to make those assumptions moving forward. And more and more of their colleagues are going to be women. And they're going to be, you know, more conditioned to the idea of, hey, cream rises. And if you get to the top, you have to be strong and competent and uh, willing to make sacrifices. And it doesn't matter what you are, or how you identify, those things all remain the same. And I think too, focusing on some of the things that unite us outside of our immutable characteristics is so important. You know, mm -hmm. like my, my most valuable friendships with women over the years have, have not come been born out of anything that's united us on an immutable characteristic front or like, you know, raw, raw girl power. It's been, it's been because we share passions or we have the same work ethic yes. or we have, similar interests in things and it's like you know 
that to me is how we that's how we chip away at some of these preconditioned biases and get to the things that actually truly unite us and that's again a delicate balance because you want to pay attention to someone's individuality Mm -hmm. in their identity but if it's the overriding mechanism then you may never feel comfortable because you just don't share that with them right so if you can find the other things that unite you then um you've got some common ground to build on and that's what that's we all exactly need. what i would say about the pandemic it has taught me so much about myself but in terms of like the way that i interact with others professionally or personally finding a way to uh, be sensitive to what another person might be going through as a human it doesn't matter if they're male female single married it doesn't matter every human has something else going on you don't know about a and people have different fears sorry to cut you off keep going no 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 i just wanted to wanted to say like some people are coming through this pandemic and they're they're worried about their health or they live with, with someone who's immunocompromised and so that's their fear Some people are worried about losing their businesses or their freedoms, and that's their fear. And it's up to all those people to choose what they're going to be fearful about. Right. And and some people are not afraid of COVID, and some people are, and some people are afraid of the vaccine, and some people are not. And it's you're right. It's up to those people, and who am I to sort of weigh in as someone who hasn't had their life experience to dismiss their concerns or fears now i think we need some some overarching things that we can all agree on so we can all get past this yeah but i don't think those always need to come at the expense of me feeling or someone who thinks like me feeling like i forced anyone to do anything that they didn't want to do mm-hmm. right and um and so yeah that that's that's helped me a lot too where i've been able to navigate and understand like oh this person is deathly afraid of COVID because they live with their mother who has cancer and they're not afraid that they're going to die, but they're afraid that they will carry the weight of guilt on their shoulders for the rest of their life if they bring it home. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't feel like I can dismiss their fears because they are coming from a different place than I am, you know? And, uh, I, I got COVID I'm vaccinated, but I, I, I got it before I was vaccinated. It wasn't a big deal for me, uh, but that also made me go, this kills people. And again, I can't be dismissive of the people who I encounter who are concerned. And it's, it's, it's not, I don't want to lie about my experience with it, but I also don't want to make someone feel like they should be falsely feeling like it's no big deal. You know, mm-hmm. just because that was my experience, it doesn't mean it's going to be anybody else's. Yeah. So. We'll put it this way. If you can, uh, like, you know, if you can find the person who you know you disagree with the most and you can find a way to have a respectful conversation with them, that's being human. Yeah. There's another clip. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) No, you're right. You're right. That's, that's it. That's, and that's what we need more of. And that's, that's why I think it's so important to, um, you know, to, cisgendered people on a podcast talking about what they can do to be more open inclusive and and respectful uh to people who don't necessarily share our identity right and and uh there's going to be people who maybe are annoyed by what we had to say and that's that's okay because i know at the end of the day that your intent is pure so is mine i'm just trying to get to the truth and we're all on that journey to some degree or another and I think at the end of the day, it's about being willing uh, to listen. It's like an interviewing skill. You can do as much talking as you want, but sometimes you have to just listen and and reflect. And you know, whether you're the podcast host or the guest, it's both sides. Finding a way to listen to someone else's perspective. Wow, what a crazy concept. <laughs> well, and it's it's the only path to understanding. Yeah. You know, and, and you're bang on when you say that about the pandemic, and I don't want to beat this point to death, but I do think it's imperative, is the more you listen to people, the more you understand why they carry the concerns, the fears. Uh, it's not about adopting their opinions. It's about right. just hear, just hear right. where they're coming from and then make your own 
your own, uh, you know. And if we all do that, we can all sit back and go, okay, I understand. Yep. I understand. I get it. And um, and through that, we can start building some more bridges. So this has been lovely. I've really enjoyed having you on, but we have talked for an hour now, which is crazy. So <laughs> sorry, I tend to do a lot of talking, but wow, well, you, you are know the um, <laughs> you're very insightful. And well, thank um, you. I appreciate what you're out there doing, and uh, thank you for all the support on the front of the artists that we represent and work with. And thank That's you for part your of the job. passion and support for the industry. And yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on, and I want to wish you and your loved ones a happy holiday season, Merry Christmas, whatever it is that resonates with you and yours. Enjoy it. Yes, Hanukkah was good to me. I got some new vinyl, and uh, yeah, you know, just to to echo what you're saying, I don't do what I do for me. I do it because I love the supporting the artists so that's what makes this industry it for me well well thanks again for doing it have a great rest of your day thanks for having me